Joining us in the Informa studio, the CEO of Self-Employed Australia, Ken Phillips. Ken, welcome. Thank you very much. Now, tell me about Self-Employed Australia. You set it up back in 2000, 2000. 21 years ago. Yeah. Happy yeah. anniversary. Thank you very much. Why? Why? We've why grown up? <laughs> yes, it, you've grown up. You've gone through a myriad of challenges and problems in that yeah. time, and addressed many issues. I dare say, yes. all to do with small business people and self-employed people. Mm. Um, uh, what are the, some of the things that piqued your uh, fancy, and, and, and I suppose were the the critical catalyst that got you going and said to yourself, "We need something like this: an advocacy group, uh, a lobby group." for small business enterprises and so on? Well, we're focused on the self-employed. Yep. So that's the individuals, yep. but anyone who's running a, what one may consider a traditional small business, say the retail shop employing a few people, the, the plumber with an apprentice, that sort of thing, they're still self-employed people. So there's 2.1 million of those people in Australia. Uh, it's around about 17% of the workforce. And they've come under enormous pressure over the last couple of years, or the last year and well, a half a bit with COVID, haven't mm, they? It, we, don't, we don't fit the political paradigm. Uh -huh. So how do you argue class consciousness in the workforce when you're both the employer and the employee all in one? You know, I, 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 I keep getting angry with myself because I keep exploiting myself. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah. a, it's, what, it's like a, a funny routine, comedy routine, except it's not funny. And no, it's, well, it's and the it's truth. Comedy. It's the yeah. truth. Yeah. And uh, when you're self-employed, you live in the marketplace. There's no protection from the marketplace. You, you take it as it comes. Mm. And what we find, and why we've been around for 21 years, is that the regulation space for independent contractors and for self-employed small business people, tends to take the attitude, look, it's just a tiny version of a big business. Mm. And so the regulations and the legislation just doesn't and fit. the red tape. It doesn't fit. Mm. Right. So what we do and what we focus on is saying, look, you have to take this at the base. And the base is these are individual people. And the regulations that we have around that have to start at that point and then you build up from there. And they must have teeth, they must be consistent, and they must actually address the challenges that each and every small business faces. So we're, we're after very practical things. So we Such as? Well, we look at me, government yep. and say, what is it you can practically do? Yep. Number one, make sure we get paid on time. So we have been in that, along with others, campaigning for that for a considerable period of time. We're very pleased to see that the federal government and the state governments have now all committed to pay their small business suppliers within, yeah. I think, five days. And yes. there's no reason with why these days of electronic uh, transfers that yes. they can't be done. Correct. They are moving now with a, which is now established, all businesses, I think, who have turned over more than 100 million, from recollection, have to report how quickly they're paying. And the next phase of that will be that if which we should see legislation this year, is that if companies don't pay their small business people on time, their small mm. business suppliers on time, that company will be denied access to government work. So we look and we say, look, you can put all the regulations and we can have all sorts of legislation, but let's look at a practical commercial outcomes here. And if Coles Meyer can't supply pens and papers to the government because they haven't paid small business on time, that's a terrific commercial incentive for them to pay people on time. So that's one thing. The what, other about, the, what about the challenges of, uh, that uh, so many of the bigger companies face with OHS, the, the arrival of uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act? Um, uh, when it did come in, it changed so much of what business was doing and had to do. And I can remember in the early days of my career, uh, the newsroom at SBS was filled with smokers. Mm. And, I ne and I was a non-smoker, not an anti-smoker, but a non-smoker. And yet everywhere around me in the studio, uh, in the studio uh, complex where we were editing, uh, which were tiny little cubicles, um, the smokers were mostly the editors and they would smoke their way through all manner of cigarettes day in, day out. Uh, and then of course, suddenly OH&S started raising huge questions about the good health 
uh, for the broader work uh, workforce. And suddenly we saw this edict come out. And I never imagined when I began television in 1980 that there would be come a day where I'd be in a studio and no one would smoke, unless your name was Graham Kennedy, mm. in which case you would go <laughs> under the set. The only problem was if you, this, one of the cameras would always see smoke, smoke wafting rising. off. But it was Graham Kennedy, he was the executive mm. producer, and we didn't raise any, any noise. Mm. But I never imagined I would see, and today, you can't smoke in the studio, mm. can't smoke in the cinema, you can't smoke in a hotel, can't smoke mm. in a restaurant. Some try, but we've seen massive changes. Mm. Now, oh s has raised another big challenge that you're right in the middle, and I, I want you to pick it up and run with it. It's a story that's very much uh, going to play out over the next, I would say, few months, or is it a few weeks? What, we, what are we expecting? So what we've got is a situation with um, what you're referring to, of course, is yeah. the outbreak of COVID Correct. in Victoria yes. with the result of 801 deaths. Yes. It didn't happen anywhere else in Australia. It happened no. in Victoria. We saw more than 800 people lose their lives. And you're challenging now, or self, uh, the uh, Self-Employed uh, Australia mm. has an action yep. against the Premier and the Minister or a number of ministers rather, and the bureaucrats uh, who were, I suppose, uh, in control of the key levers, the power levers, during the COVID outbreak. Yeah? So what we're dealing with is that the government has admitted in the COVID, in the COAT inquiry, yes. under evidence. Yeah, where they, they couldn't recall what was going on and they who was responsible. That, well, they couldn't, yeah. they couldn't understand, they couldn't explain why it was happening. So we had a an inquiry that said, at the end of the inquiry, we don't know. Interesting result. But the evidence is quite clear, and the government has admitted, they had control of the hotel quarantine. They set it up, they had total and complete control, even though they had contractors come in to do various bits and pieces. Mm. And as a result of the failures to manage that properly, COVID broke out, yes. and we had the 801 deaths. Yep. Simple fact. The Occupational Health and Safety Act of Victoria, and which is very parallel to the other acts in the other states, holds that if you had control, you are responsible. Fairly simple position. Yes. Very sensible. Mm -hmm. So the act says that if you had control, and something happened which breaks, breaches the act, a death, an injury, and it doesn't yeah. even have to be a death or an yeah. injury, yeah. just you have done, you know, you have an incident. Yes. You are responsible. So you are in breach of this You're part of the act? You're in breach of the act. Okay. So and the breach we're talking about, or that part of the act, is uh, 131, section 131. Right. Section 131 is a trigger in the act which anyone can avail themselves of uh -huh. that if the responsible authority being the worksafe authority in victoria doesn't initiate a prosecution within six months anyone can turn around and say write to them and say we request that you undertake an investigation with a view to prosecution and they're obliged to uh, and so that request is essentially they can't say no uh -huh. they are required to so they can then turn around and ask for extensions of time. So they can ask for three extensions of time. The section, each extension of three months. The second extension expires at the end of this month. Uh -huh. They can ask for a third one, which takes us to the end of June. And then by the end of June, they must inform us whether or not they are prosecuting and if they are not prosecuting, they must inform us why in detail. It's not just good enough to say, oh, we don't think we And will. the us in this instance is Self-Employed Australia, correct? Yes. Okay. So the, it was me who wrote to them as the Executive Director of Self-Employed right. Australia. So remember, we have alleged 142 breaches of the Act by some 20 people and four government entities. 
the WorkSafe Authority must reply to us on each of those 142 allegations that we have made. They must either prosecute or explain in detail, in detail why they are not prosecuting. Then if they don't prosecute on any one of the 142, we are then able to write and request that they refer the matter to the Director of Public Prosecutions, which they must then do, and the Director of Public Prosecutions must then take over and undertake an investigation. Um, the people that uh, you've alleged have breached uh, the Act and uh, face the 141 uh, charges uh, start at the top. Yes. The Premier? Yes. The Health Minister at the time? We have, we have named the Premier and three Ministers at the time. Yes, and a number of bureaucrats? And 16 bureaucrats. 16 bureaucrats. These, these are criminal charges. These are criminal charges. These are criminal charges. That's the last thing any member of that government or the bureaucracy of the public service would want to stain their uh, CV or indeed any legacy. Well, you can't go to the thing. United States. Ah. You get a conviction. <laughs> yes. You get a criminal charge against you. You can't go to the United States, for example, my understanding. Right. But of course, you know, who wants a criminal conviction? So this is, this is serious and The stuff. ramifications are uh, enormous. Uh, enormous. Down the track even, there's another election coming up soon in the next year and a half. Um, the, the, um, the outcome uh, is, uh, as I say, is, is extraordinary. So, all right, so here's the timeline. You, we are, we ne you will hear by June. Is that the last? Uh, they must. They must answer or respond to you by that this OHS yes. yes. must respond to you or WorkSafe Australia must Work, it's work, work safe, safe Victoria. Victoria in this instance must respond to you by June. And then of course if there are if there is something that, that needs to be addressed, it uh, the uh, the report would then go to the Director of Public Prosecutions Correct. to see whether or not uh, there's something that uh, they need to act on. My understanding, yes. I'm not a lawyer, yep. but I've got... You're not a lawyer, not a, an accountant, but you've <laughs> managed to do all of this yeah. in the last, uh, well, 20, 21 years. Yep. It's been so tremendous. My understanding of the process is that the WorkSafe Authority undertake the prosecution themselves, uh -huh. but if they don't, it then can get referred and, and we will seek to get it referred to the... The, the, the legal advice that you've received, mm. What, what is the likely outcome? Is the Premier uh, likely to face charges? Well, we're not, that's for the court to decide. Uh -huh. right? okay. that's, so what we do and what we're able to do- You're shining a light. You're we're making up... allegations. Yep. We, those allegations are made on the basis of that the evidence is just overwhelming that investigation must occur and it hadn't occurred, and then if the investigation demonstrates that there should be prosecutions, then it will go through the normal process and the courts will decide the outcome. Um, I, I, how many people saw this coming? When did, when did it dawn on you that there was something substantial that Self-Employed Australia had to act on? When did it become apparent that things weren't being done or needed to be done or had been let go? Was it after the coat inquiry, did you sit there and, and wait for the outcome of the coat inquiry? And when that didn't provide the sort of responses you needed, or indeed the clarity that so many Victorians had wanted to hear, um, was that when you started uh, preparing the way forward to no, well you know, before to send, well, well before, before that well before it? the coat inquiry? Okay, I, okay. I can't recall the exact timelines, okay. but I suspect probably before it was even. Announced. So while the code inquiry was, was running, you must have been thinking to yourself, let's see what comes out of this. But in the meantime, you had already set the wheels in motion. Well, I had been in discussions with OHS lawyers and the discussions with them, all of a sudden we went, oh my goodness. And then the revelation that there was this section 131 that we could utilise. We actually wrote to WorkSafe well over a month before the deadline, which is the six months, saying, look, we're flagging, this is what we're going to do. Wow. 
and then followed that up at the appropriate time, 29th of September from recollection, and issued them the appropriate letter with the appropriate wording under my so very uh, clear legal advice. So we await to hear now uh, June, that timeline. That's, yes. the, that's the final lever, isn't it? Or the final uh, date and uh, failing uh, you hearing uh, the, uh, the response that you want, you will then uh, set in the next set of uh, wheels in motion I'd, I'd, to I'd get almost, the director of property, yeah, I'd, director I'd almost property. say that the end of June is the starting gun. Uh, this has been the preparation for the, for the race and the 29th of June is when it, it really seriously starts. We would hope that WorkSafe undertake prosecutions and exceedingly robust prosecutions, but the fact they're, they're now saying from recollection that they started investigation, I think they said in July mm -hmm. from recollection, but that's March, April, May, June, July, right? I thought June or July. So they sat doing nothing for three to four months. Did they think it was going to go away? Well, I've no idea. What Did they, they not understand I, the, I, the, I, the, the ramifications? I can't climb into the head of Worksite. Have you had any correspondence at all with the government? We've had considerable correspondence with Worksafe. Okay, okay. So let's see what transpires. What we have to remember and understand with this, mm. if a factory had blown up in the western suburbs of Melbourne yes. and caught fire, and burnt for months and spewed out invisible toxic chemicals right across the community and we had 801 people die as a result of that. We'd be having a real commission. WorkSafe would have been in there day one. And if it was a run by a, a private company, everyone from the chairman right through the whole, whole lot would have been under investigation and I dare say prosecution. This is exactly what we're dealing with here. This is the issue. This is no different from a factory blowing up. If WorkSafe fail to undertake full, robust, and I mean really robust prosecutions. They're derelict in their duty. Right. Derelict in it, but understand the implications of that. It destroys the entire work safety system in Victoria because every incident that occurs from here on in the defence will be, we didn't know how it happened. It's almost like a house of cards. Th they can't One ignore this. One wrong move this. and it can all come crashing down. They can't ignore this. Ken Phillips, thank you for uh, coming in and joining us in the studio and uh, giving us a sense of, of what you've been doing for the better part of the last 21 years. Uh, Self-Employed Australia, they're an advocacy group working as hard as possible to make sure that the small business enterprises right across the state and right across the country get the best possible advice they can to make each and every day of their working lives as comfortable and as, and as proper as uh, it can be. Uh, we thank you very much and for raising this uh, particular topic that um, not that many Victorians would know about. We haven't heard too much about it. Uh, is this the uh, first time that it's been aired in public? My understanding is that it is, but I think everyone in Victoria is Why aware... Why is the mainstream media not moving in? I've, I've got to say that there are journalists who are picking up on this now. Yes. And I think that's extremely important because this is an issue that everyone in Victoria needs to know and understand. And it affects everyone. Every single one of us. Every single one of us. I, I had a... Uh, a plumber come to our house yesterday, a mm. uh, young man, young man from my angle anyway, in his early 20s, I suppose. His, and, early, his early days. Early days. <laughs> and lovely fellow, really knew his plumbing, came in, did a great job. And I, you know, I thought to myself, that guy deserves to go home to his family every day. Correct. That's what we're doing here. Right? We're protecting the system that must ensure as best we can that he can go home safely every day. And if we don't proceed with this prosecution, that's what's at risk here. People need to understand that. Ken, thank you very much for coming in. 
for uh, uh, giving us a sense of what's at stake and just how important uh, the, uh, the, uh, the date of uh, the end of June is likely to be. We, let's see now what transpires and indeed how much of this story is picked up by the broader mainstream media and uh, whether or not we get the action that each and every Victorian deserves and we, and we get the whole case prosecuted as openly and as uh, clearly as possible and we get clarity for everybody. And I dare say, if we get a, a good and positive decision, it will be, it'll resonate throughout Australia, will it not? Oh, no question. Yes. Yeah. Ken Phillips joining us in this informal studio and giving us a sense of a story that's been bubbling behind the scenes, but now it's getting very, very close to uh, being aired. And it's a story that will affect each and every Victorian.